Welcome to The Craft. I'm your host, Mae Globus. This podcast is a collection of intimate conversations on artistry, mastery, and life with talented, passionately curious creatives and entrepreneurs. Most are dear friends, some are those I've admired from afar. I hope you enjoy these conversations, this exploration of the humanity that connects all of us as much as I do having them. Thank you for being here and for listening. This episode is brought to you by Before, an incredible new self-care brand that just launched their first products, a line of purifying toothpaste. I'm obsessive about my teeth and brush them usually three times a day, so I'm super excited to be using Before. It ticks off many boxes of what a good toothpaste should be. Their custom super mint flavor actually tastes really good, and the consistency is silky, and at the same time, it doesn't leak out of the tube, which is a total pet peeve of mine. It's also non-abrasive, so it doesn't destroy your tooth enamel. All the harmful ingredients have been replaced by clean alternatives, and their custom blend of fluoride and dentist-approved ingredients totally promotes optimal mouth health. Before also deeply cares about our planet. Their tubes are made from 100% recyclable plant-based sugar cane and creates 50% less carbon footprint than traditional toothpaste tubes. As you all can tell from the show, I'm a huge fan of good, purposeful design, and let me tell you, the design and color palette of these are beautiful. The tube stands upright on your counter and makes your bathroom look minimal and chic. Visit their website, before.com, and enter the code CRAFT10, C-R-A-F-T-1-0, to receive 10% off your entire purchase. One-time use per customer. I'm a huge fan of what they stand for. You won't be sorry, and your teeth and the planet will thank you. As a number of you know, I'm also a certified sound therapy practitioner and founder of Oto Healing, a sound therapy studio and practice. Sound has been a healing modality through many cultures for thousands of years. Oto's approach to sound is rooted in both art and science, the art being the history of sound, the science being quantum physics, biology, brainwave states, and more. All listeners of the show get 15% off their first private one-hour session. Visit otohealing.com to book yours now. Donnell Garcia walks with a vibe of confidence, but it's one that's chill and observant. For many years, he was a care worker drawn to behavioral development programs, helping figure out what people were good at and helping them create routines to integrate them back into society. Photography was a side hobby that became a career, working with clients like Lululemon, Half Moon, Livestock, Vans Vault, and more. His work has also been widely shown in print and digital publications like Street Dreams magazine. Working out of a living taste studio, He also launched an incredible community library of art, fashion, photography, and design books and magazines called Book Section, where they can be signed out for two weeks. Returns are by honor system. He was born in the Philippines, immigrating with his parents to East Vancouver when he was five. An only child, Donnell was often left to his own devices, catching the train downtown to explore and also playing sports, mainly basketball. After observing a care worker friend of his parents, he started to look into nursing programs and worked as a nurse for more than five years. It was meeting twin brothers, who quickly became his friends, that opened up his world to photography, art, fashion, and music. When they founded an agency, Donnell became their photographer, marking his transition into a new career and purpose. In this conversation, we wander through a wide range of topics, what people want for those who are caretaking for them, how his work as a nurse has translated into his work as an artist and photographer, observing patterns in the world, conversation, and interactions, Donnell's approach to mentoring emerging photographers, why he's taken a break from photography at this moment and recalibrating his vision, the honesty in his artistic point of view, and much more. Please enjoy this conversation with the easygoing, open-minded, and super perceptive Donnell Garcia. Donnell Donnell so. Garcia, welcome to the craft. <laughs> <laughs> Going with the first and last name. Yeah. Big entrance. This is your first podcast. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I don't think I've ever recorded a podcast before. So yeah, how are you feeling I've ever about been, it? Like in front of a mic like this before. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. I guess it's like I mean I've always had like conversations with people, but never in like 
this type of setting. So yeah, I'm sure the, it'll just the be officials the same. to yeah. the setting. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I always say this is a conversation between friends. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, you and I met through, I believe, Eric Veloso mm-hmm. when yeah, yeah. you were working in the Street Dreams office. Mm-hmm. And yeah, sort of doing work with a bunch of people that I know actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I always thought, oh, this guy has such a good vibe. I'd love to talk to him one day about yeah. what <laughs> what's going on with him. And I mean, I follow mm-hmm. your work and. Mm-hmm. Your work is really amazing and, and beautiful, and it just has a way of, of telling a story mm-hmm. um, that I think is really compelling. So cool. I'm so happy you're here, and I'm so happy to be your first ever <laughs> episode of hopefully many. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> for you. I mean, thank you. That was like a huge compliment. I never really get to hear like um, feedback about my stuff for people that like aren't my friends. I mean, I always expect like my friends to be like, oh, yeah, that was sick. But I mean, you're my friends. Of course, you got to think. It's sick, so it's nice to hear. Yeah. Um, that I also have a good vibe too. So Yeah, <laughs> you really do. Um, but yeah, I I definitely want to um go back to, you know, young Danelle mm-hmm. and um yeah, you were born in the <clears> Philippines. <throat> so so tell me about your story coming over here to North America. Um yeah, well I came here when I was about like four or five years old. And um I don't remember much like about being in the Philippines. I mean, I can only have like, like very partial memories from when I was like a kid, just through like photo albums and stuff that my parents keep. And I'll be like, "Oh yeah, I think I remember that like second birthday party, like that type of stuff." Um, and then I pretty much went straight. Like, I remember like, I remember coming off the plane and like meeting my family for the first time, like on my dad's side. I was like growing up with my mom's side in the Philippines. And then I just remember, like, just going straight into school. Like, I don't remember anything in between, like, landing and then school. But, yeah, I just remember, like, going straight into school. And I don't know, like, how I learned English. My mom told me that I just, like, was watching a lot of TV. And that's how I just, like, learned English. But, um, yeah. And then I just, like, that was that was me, like, coming coming to Canada. And then I just went straight into school. And I just kind of acclimated really fast yeah right right yeah, straight yeah. into kindergarten mm-hmm. growing up in east van mm-hmm. and then um, burnaby like metro town area yeah yeah? yeah 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 um what do you remember about your did you observe anything in terms of how your parents navigated the change mm. coming over I, here i think what i did notice was that um my mom had a lot of jobs that was like the one thing that I noticed because I would be like a little kid and I would be with my dad and my dad maybe had one or two jobs that I knew of when I um, came to Canada, or at least I was conscious about. I knew that he was like, he's always been working for the Vancouver School Board as like a custodian, but it was like the first like four or five years was like, um, it was kind of like, uh, what do you call it? It, it was like part time. He wasn't like staffed at like a, single school he was even like the custodian at my elementary school for a little bit too um but yeah and then um i just knew yeah i just knew my mom had a lot of jobs they like ranged from like working at a bakery in south granville to like a 7-eleven like down the street to like another bakery on like oak and 16th which my a lot of my family members still work at which is kind of cool um but yeah i just remember them like working a lot of jobs and i think i was only really conscious about um how they were navigating like the their like move to Canada until I got older Mm. um but it felt like pretty I never felt like it was like we were I don't know struggling or anything like that because we had so much family and we all lived in the same house so it felt very normal to me like I would be like at home with like five of my cousins two of my uncles three of my aunts my grandparents my parents and like and then I'd be out, I'd be like, like sitting on the couch watching like Full House, and it was like the same thing. So it's like, oh yeah, like we live a pretty normal life. And mm. my parents never, um, my parents, I think they never wanted to like, I guess like uh, expose me to like their hardships when I was younger. So mm-hmm. they wanted me to as much as much as they can. They wanted to give me like a kind of experience that they would think that I guess like other kids or other people in Canada would have so like every two weeks when they got paid they would like buy me a new shirt or like buy me a new new pair of shoes or like take me out or something like that and we'd like kind of do normal things I guess that Mm. things that maybe 
I don't know now if they could have re- really afforded it back then, but I feel like they were trying really hard to make sure that like it didn't feel like we were like um I guess like uh like struggling immigrants or whatever. So like mm. I felt very um I don't know. I felt very spoiled. I guess I felt very spoiled when I was a kid. Plus, I'm like an only child. I was going to ask, are you yeah, the only I have, child? Yeah, I have no, yeah. I have no siblings, so they really only had like me to focus on. So it was like it was kind of nice. And I mean, I grew up with all my cousins, so I didn't never felt like I had like like the only child syndrome type thing. A lot of people when they when they meet me, they're like, oh, yo, you're an only child. And I'm like, yeah, like you don't feel like it. And I'm like, I don't know what that's supposed to feel like, but I guess, but. I mean, looking back at it, yeah, I feel like I was very um, fortunate to, for my parents to be able to, like, not, um, like, if I was like, oh, like, I saw this kid at school, he had this, like, really cool, like, bike, and they'd be like, okay, we'll get you a bike, you know what I mean? Mm. So they were like, yeah, regardless or not, whether I know now or not, if they had the means to do that, they still just tried anyways, mm. and they gave me that experience, which I'm, like, super fortunate, like, to have, Yeah. so... Of course. Yeah. I mean, I thank my parents a lot for <laughs> for what they've uh, let me do yeah, in my yeah. life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, uh, if you were going to, you know, describe each of your parents in mm. a couple of words, what mm. would you say? I'd say my dad is um, very uh, creative, um, musical, and uh, um, disciplined. Um, he's a military guy, so he's, like, very very rigid sometimes um but he's also a musician so he's also very free yeah. flowing as well um you don't normally hear creative and disciplined like, <laughs> yeah. together. yeah yeah but he's like yeah so he has like those two sides of him where it's like you know like he, he like you won't see a single like crumb on the floor of our apartment um but at the same time like you'll always hear like music and there's like a bunch of random instruments around the place or whatever so he's like and he'll be like playing the trumpet at like 11 p.m i'm like why are you doing this <laughs> you know so it's like it's like you're the one that's like telling me to go to sleep at nine but you're playing the trumpet at 11 like that doesn't yeah. make sense it's like something in his soul it's yeah, gotta yeah, do yeah, yeah, it yeah, yeah um my mom i would say is very i guess she i would say she's very um caring most caring um very sensitive and i would say I guess like loving. I mean, I feel like those are like the top three words that anybody hopefully would yeah. describe what what a mother is. But yeah, I feel like she's definitely like the. Um, I guess if there's another one, I would say fashionable. Mm. Yeah. So she went to like a university that was like half business, half fashion. Mm. So she was like kind of. I mean, she was going to school for business, but like, yeah. But mm. I like she is the type of person that will like go to the grocery store, but like with a full fit on. I love, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Your yeah. mom has her own swag. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. Yeah. yeah. I think it's so funny what you were saying about watching Full House and you're like, oh yeah, mm. this is yeah, yeah. this is totally normal. Like yeah. I'm in a normal situation. Yeah. But the thing about that was like Full House wasn't normal either. You don't yeah. like call yeah. white families. Yeah. I, I don't feel like yeah. usually live with yeah. their yeah. uncles and mm. like mm. everyone. But anyways, I think that's so funny. Um, but I'd love to know what were you like? What were you like as a kid? And then as you started to grow mm. up into a teenager, you know, what, what, yeah, how did you, how did you see the world? I think when I was a kid, I had like a lot of freedom because like my parents were always working, which I didn't, never saw that as like a, I never saw that as like, oh, my parents are never home, like type of thing. I was always like, cool, my parents aren't home, you know, <laughs> like, and I just kind of understood that like they were working. So I just thought growing up, that was just like so normal. So I was very like, I had a lot of freedom to do different things and I guess because I was like like mostly even though I did live in the house with a bunch of my family I was like mostly like alone like playing video games or playing with my toys or playing basketball outside and the cousins that I lived with um um they were like really like girly girls so they would never play sports with me and stuff like that so like I would just like go to the park on my own and stuff like that and I had I remember I had like a I had like my dad I didn't have a key but I had like the um garage door opener yeah. so that was like my key to get in and out of the house so but that was also like like since i live with my grandparents like when they would hear the garage door open they'd be like oh like <laughs> donald's get, going out of the house <laughs> so that was like their kind of like alarm for like oh like for them to like poke their head out the window like hey where are you going and i'm like i'm going to the park to play basketball um but yeah they pretty much like 
my parents like I, they were very um yeah they allowed me to do like so many things which i think is like um i don't i i think it's just because they are working so much that they couldn't really pay attention to like what i was doing and um that i think with that freedom allowed me to like really explore like the things that i liked and mm. did so many different things and i remember like i remember like being like seven eight years old and like taking the bus and the sky train by myself you know because i was like i didn't like in the summer like i have nowhere to go and like i'm just like oh what should i do and i remember like go, knowing how to take the bus and the sky train with my mom to like go to the mall so i would just do that like by myself and then sometimes i would just like be like 10 years old like taking the, the sky train to like downtown and like i don't know where i am but i know how to get there and back and then my parents i would come home like before it gets dark and my parents were like okay like dinner's here and they would never ask me and about my day i'm safe. 10 years old yeah you know i'm 10 years old they're not gonna be like what'd you do today they probably i just went, oh i played basketball but really i was like mm. downtown <laughs> like walking around like doing nothing no yeah. money just like walking around looking at stuff so i think um i wonder if they would have freaked out more if you were like yeah i went downtown yeah maybe maybe i don't know like one time i think i told my mom I was like yeah i went to metro town and she was like what and i was like Never mind. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 I didn't go to Metro Town at all. I'm like, oh, I went with my cousin Janice or whatever. And he's like, oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I was very, um, um, I think that experience really allowed me to like get to know myself. Like, I think as I got older, I knew that that was, I recognized that, that what I was, that's what I was doing because I felt like when I was, when I became like a, more like conscious like teenager at like 16 I was talking to my friends and I was talking to like people at my high school and stuff like that and I was realizing that they had so many um different like levels of like self-consciousness and self-doubt and like um non I guess like I don't know what the opposite of self-awareness is but like they didn't I could tell that they, they were like still kind of like getting to know themselves Whereas I felt like really confident in like myself. And I think that like, and I think that was just like me being able to like form my own opinions without like, I guess that also goes with me being an only child. It's like, I don't have like an older brother or older sister telling me like, you suck or that's lame or that's cool. So I didn't, I was forming my own opinions. So I was very confident of what I thought was cool and what I thought wasn't cool and what I really liked and what I didn't like. And I, it, like I never had like anybody to like sway me in mm. any direction. So when I like came, so when I was talking to like my other friends, like I would notice like my other friends, like, like, you know, there's always like the leader of the friend group. <laughs> I could tell that like my, my friends would be like always trying to copy the leader of the friend group. Whereas I was kind of like, it, it, I would follow if it made sense to me, but if it didn't, then I'd be like, I'm I'm cool you know mm. what I mean like I don't I don't do that or like I'm not with that or or I am you know what I mean but like I think that was something that like I noticed in myself like um as a teenager compared mm. to like the other people that were my age and uh, what were you drawn to um I think I was like well I grew up like kind of like a I was like a jock like in high school so I only like played sports that was like the biggest thing in my life was just like basketball anything sports related I did not think about art whatsoever. <laughs> I think like um I think like art program at my school was not great. My school was like a my high school was like a prep school for sports. So like everybody there played sports. So like I mean that's the biggest reason why I went to that high school is cuz like I wanted to play sports and I wanted to play at a school that was good at sports. Um but the art program was pretty not cool <laughs> and we were, were doing something they were like i still took the art classes though because i i just thought that they would be easy <laughs> but i did find but as soon as i like went into the art courses i was like oh this is like this is cool like i definitely would categorize myself as a creative person like i could feel like my brain like working when i'm like painting and sculpting and stuff like that but it was never something that i assumed that i would want to pursue mm -hmm. i was very drawn to just like the outdoors and being outside and like playing sports and like being with my friends and like always being with my friends and just like always like doing stuff like with my hands and stuff like that 
And of course, like music is like, I hope is like a big part in everybody's lives, but I was listening to a lot of music for sure. And yeah, I mean, there wasn't really like, I mean, I guess there was internet when I was high school, but it wasn't like, we didn't have like Facebook or anything like that when Mm -hmm. I was in high school. So like, I was just consuming a lot of like books, which like, I guess kind of makes sense. I mean, that was like, I think um, that was like the big thing that I was doing. I was like collecting a lot of like magazines when I was growing up, a lot of sports magazines, but also just random stuff that like my uncle who I lived with, he's like my young uncle. So when I was like in elementary school, he was like in high school. So he was kind of growing up in like the 90s hip hop era. So like every, so when I would like, it was like one of those, I don't know if you've ever seen movies where like a little kid goes into their big brother's room and they have like all this crazy stuff. Like he would have like all the latest hats, like all like, like the source magazines with Tupac and Biggie on it. And he'd have all the cool like basketball jerseys, like everything. And, and of course I'd be like stealing the clothes like <laughs> and wearing them to of school, course. <laughs> up to school. Like, while wow, obviously my uncle's like at high school, I'm like, Oh, I'm just going to wear this. I'm just going to wear this Michael Jordan Jersey. I don't, I don't know why my, you know, my uncle keeps this wrapped in plastic, but I'm going to take it out of the plastic did and wear it to school. Did, did you get a whooping after? <laughs> yeah. Uncle? My uncle, I, my uncle was pretty nice about it, but he was kind of like, don't, don't touch my stuff. <laughs> just ask me if you want to wear this. And it was funny. Cause it's like, obviously like, Back then, the style was, like, super baggy. So it's, like, super baggy on this guy who's, like, 5'9". So it's obviously <laughs> going to be, like, extra baggy on me who's, like, 5'2". <laughs> so, <laughs> like, uh, but, yeah, those were the kind of things that I was, like, really drawn to, like, in school. And as I was, like, growing up, like, as a kid and, like, whatever, I was just kind of, like, um, yeah. Sounds like you were sports. just exploring, yeah, too. Like, yeah, just 100%. sort of, like, going with it mm-hmm. in, in a way. Um, yeah, and I find that it's interesting. You were doing a lot of sports, and then after high school, you went into physiotherapy. That's mm-hmm. where you got your degree in, which surprised me when you were telling me that mm-hmm. in our sort of like chat a couple mm-hmm. of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was uh, actually it was nursing. Nursing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like. Um, I didn't, never really thought about like, like while I was in high school, I never really thought that much about like what I wanted to do after high school. Um, I was kind of exploring like the options, and I thought that. Actually, I did try to take like courses to get into the physio program the first year I was like in college, but I realized that that wasn't really something that I wanted to do. Like, I think, um, I think I was, I, I like, I knew that like my extent of playing really high level sports was in high school. I like knew that like right away. Like, I knew that like, like, I really loved basketball, and I think. I like to think I was really good at basketball in high school. Um, But I knew that, like, I'm not going to, like, play in college and I'm not going to make it to the NBA or, like, you know, I'm not going to get – I'm not going to try and try out for, like, some colleges in the States or whatever. Like, I I knew. I mean, I'm, like – at the time, I was, like, 5'8", maybe dripping wet, like, 135 pounds or something like that. Like, really skinny guy, like, small guy. And I just knew that, like – even though I loved basketball, I knew that that wasn't what I was going to do as a profession. So I figured I'm like, oh, well, I really like sports. So maybe like physiotherapy, but then I didn't really like, I don't really like it. I think, I think mainly because I didn't really like the people that were in my classes. I mean, that's a a huge part of it. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, wait a second. Like, these are all the guys that I, that play sports that I don't like that are trying to be physiotherapists. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, I don't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't know about this. So um, nursing was like, surprisingly, none of my family are nurses. Like none of my aunts or uncles or anybody are nurses. But I think I was just kind of like um, um, one of my mom's friends, my parents' friends, he was like, like a caregiver he was a caretaker and um I would see him like at the mall and I would see him like hanging out with my parents and stuff like that and I thought his job seemed pretty cool like he was just like kind of walking around with his clients and stuff like that and just like chilling with them and yeah I guess he was making a lot of money too at the time it was a lot of money I guess and I remember like going to his place and he was like oh like I was like, oh, this is this is a nice this is a nice apartment. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this this is kind of cool. And I was like, and so I, um, I, that was like when I was in high school, and I thought, oh, maybe this is something that I maybe could do. It seems pretty chill, and like, I think my only goal, like coming out of high school, was that like I just wanted to have like a stable job. 
I just wanted to have like, I kind of wanted wanted a pretty like nuclear life where I was like, I need a good job so then I could like hopefully like get married and then like have kids and get a house and stuff like that, which is still things that I value right now. Um, but um, that was like my whole goal. I didn't have any like dreams of like having a studio and having this library and like being a photographer or anything like that. I just wanted to have that as my life. And so I was like, okay, what's the quickest way I can do this? And so I was like, I'll just take this like quick, like nursing program. Um, and so I did that for like the next two years after like my one semester of like taking um, physiotherapy classes. And then I I didn't really enjoy school, but I like, I guess I like the learning aspect, but I just didn't like the school like setting, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, like if I like, if I was going to school right now, I think I would love it. Like, like going to school, like working from home. Like, I think I would love it. Like, I think that's the best way that I like to learn. But yeah, I just like, what's the quickest thing? And then my mom signed me up for this, like, I guess like Vancouver Community College or whatever. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, I don't care about like going to like a UBC or SFU. That doesn't really matter to me. I just want to like get this over with so I can start working and like get on with my life and like, you know, get married to my girlfriend. I'll do all that stuff. Right. And then, um, yeah, so that's what I did. I went to school for nursing and then I worked as a nurse for like um, about like five, five to seven years after, after I graduated. And like, yeah, that was my life up until I like started to take photography more seriously. <laughs> what did you notice when you were in the care profession mm -hmm. about what people just really, really want um, in terms of like someone looking after them? Mm. I think like, I think, um, I mean, so I, I took like the nursing program, but I realized that I could have taken like a way quicker and um, cheaper program to do what I wanted to do. Um, I really wanted to work with like, like I really wanted to work with people um, with autism. That was like kind of like, that was kind of the, the realm of like caretaking that I wanted to uh, work with just because I like had a had a nephew um, that was autistic. I didn't really know what that meant. And when I first met my nephew, I was like fourteen, so I was like I, I've never like had experience like people with autism before. I didn't really know what that meant. But then as soon as like the as soon as I could like look up what autism meant, I was like, oh, this is like um, this is interesting. I've never like heard about something like this, and um, and yeah, and then. I don't know. I just like thought that that's what I, I just found that that was like really interesting, like how um, I guess their brains work and their behaviors and all that stuff. I thought that it was cool how you could like, like, I don't know. I just felt like, like my nephew, he was like really, really amazing at like drawing and like, but then like, but then he was not that amazing at anything else. But I thought, but I found it so interesting that like, how could like you basically be this like young like Basquiat, but then like you can't like, but then he also like can't understand like how to like open like a can of pop or something like that. And I'm like, that's so like, some people might look at that and be like, whoa, that's like a disability. But for me, I'm like, wait a second, but look at the painting though. <laughs> like look at the drawing mm -hmm. though. Like that's kind of crazy. Like how does that work? And um so I was like really drawn to that, and I think like the being in like the care industry really like help. I think helped me um, understand. Um, I don't know. It really. I think all those like things like help like transfer over to, I guess like art and like and mentorship and just like how much people and just like how much like. Um, I guess for myself, like how much like care like I put into myself and like my work, and I don't know. There's there's a lot of like things that 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 I learned like being in care that transfer over to what I do now, and I think like I might not be like caring for like um, people with autism, but now there's like I feel like everybody <laughs> needs like a level of like level of like someone to care for them for them to be like for them to um blossom i mm. guess like that yeah 
Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. like that's what I'm experiencing right now, like kind of mentoring and teaching like younger photographers that like like learning from myself being a self taught photographer. It's like if I had someone like me when I was 20 years old discovering photography, I think maybe I'd be farther along. Mm. You know what I mean? Because I think like it when you're in like when you're in like that um, point, like learning and all that stuff and you're kind of lost and you're kind of looking at like who do I look at or like where do I go or like how do I how do I reach the things that I want to reach? It does like take like someone to care for you like a parent to be like, hey, like um, this is here's some suggestions of where you can go. And I think that's like kind of that was a goal of like kind of the program that I was working in in um, with working with people with autism. What it was very um, we would create like schedules and routines for them um, based on the things that we discover that they might be good at. And then once we discover that, we're like, okay, like now we can create like this whole new program to help them like get them integrated into the community and for them to feel like they're part of the rest of the world. And I feel like that's the same way that I look at myself as a photographer and other people who want to like enter the industry or like be like or reach the things that they want to reach like in art. Yeah, like yeah. what's your unique gift? Yeah. And yeah, let's yeah. let's nurture yeah. nurture that. Hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. I'm just thinking too of what you're saying in terms of what you learned in care and mm-hmm. how you're applying it to art. Um, in care there's a certain there's a certain level of observation mm-hmm. that you need to be able to do. Like mm-hmm. what does this person need now or mm-hmm. how are they reacting mm-hmm. to to this? And I, I wonder if that f- that continued to like finally hone your levels of observation which then lend to like a more beautiful and nuanced eye when it comes to photography. Mm. Yeah. I think that like, I think that like when you're an artist, like you have to spend like so much time, like thinking and observing and like talking and conversating and like looking at like patterns, uh, patterns like in the world and patterns in conversation and patterns with your interactions. And then hopefully like those patterns, um, trigger something where you're like oh like this thing is like very important this pattern is happening in the world and i think it needs like i'm starting to think about it more and i'm observing it and how these patterns affect like people outside of my world and people in my world and then and then hopefully that pattern is strong enough for you to like feel inspired to make something and then and then you have to like choose how you want to make it and i think that's like i think that's um yeah the observe the obs the observing part is like kind of like a huge huge part in both like care and like being an artist because you have to like yeah you have to take a lot of time like looking at stuff in order to like feel like um in order to like i don't know like pounce at that like opportunity to like say something really important Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. there's almost like a hyper vigilance to yeah. caregiving right yeah. like you've yeah, got to yeah. be able to see but kind of like mm-hmm. anticipate mm-hmm. as well I'm, I'm curious about what you're saying about patterns in the mm-hmm. world is mm-hmm. are there a couple of patterns that you are seeing happening in culture right now that mm-hmm. you're super fascinated with and you're kind of digging really deep into mm-hmm. um i guess like the most like most like uh um uh, right now i kind of like am seeing the pattern of like what types of art and art forms that people are like getting attracted to throughout the years. I think in 2014, 2015, everybody wanted to be a photographer because of Instagram. It was so easy to be like, take, take up a camera. And now I'm seeing that like the past couple of years, I've been seeing a lot of people that I knew were really into photography in 2014, haven't touched a camera since 2016. <laughs> and I think it's because like you, you pick up this art form and then you're like, oh, this is really cool. And then it opens you up to another world of like, Oh, actually, like through photography, I found, you know, like digital art or like graphic design. And then I noticed that like a lot of people were like really drawn to like graphic design. And then those graphic designers like now are really into like digital art, like NFTs, AI and stuff like that. And then now I'm kind of seeing like a now I'm kind of seeing like like a like a backtrack because like technology is so fast. Now I'm starting to see a lot of young people like backtrack and like be almost anti-technology and it's like i don't know i think that's like now i'm kind of like oh how come like these younger people are like so like anti-technology like or like 
they are very fascinated with like two early 2000s photography like shooting with like like photographers shooting with these like small point and shoot digital cameras that like probably our parents like bought mm-hmm. when we were kids why so, do you think they are i think it's like i think it's for young people i think it's always i think noticing the pattern of myself i was always like obsessed with like an era that i never that i lived in but never experienced so it's like i was like like when i was growing up i was really i lived in the 90s but i wasn't conscious in the 90s right so i'm like when i see 90s things i'm really obsessed with it even though i never like had to experience it and i was like oh i really love like wu-tang i really love like tupac but it's like i was like I should not have been listening to that to that music and I'm listening to it now because like I'm allowed to listen to it now and I'm really obsessed like with that era and anybody that like I meet like who actually grew up in that area I'm like really curious to ask them about like oh so like turntables right like what's up with that you know what I mean <laughs> but I think now young these younger people who are like like 20 like 19 to 25 are like they never lived in the early 2000s. Sure, mm-hmm. they were like babies or they were like young kids when Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake and all this music and this type of like technology and this type of like aesthetic was like really big. Like it was around them. So they're very um, like sentimental to it. But like I, I like hang out with a lot of like younger people and they'll come over to my apartment and they'll like look, they'll like look at my stuff and like, whoa dvds what's this you know what i mean yeah. it's like why do you have so many dvds and i'm like oh i don't know like that's how you used to watch movies <laughs> like that's why i have like 50 dvds and they're like oh so like what did you do you had to like put the disc in this thing and then i play it and like it's like kind of like it's kind of funny but i yeah. think that's why like i think that's like i think that'll be like a pattern like a pattern like forever like people will always like kind of live in this area but not be conscious mm. in this era and then once they're like conscious people, then like, I mean, everything kind of like, to, uh, everything always like comes back. Like even in fashion, like everything always comes back. And then it's always like, it's because like it's like people like me who are like probably like thirty in their mid thirties that reach a certain level in their career were like, oh, I'm like, you know, like I've I've become like the head designer of this like fashion brand, and I'm inspired by. The, the era that I grew up in, which is early 2000s, but the people who are consuming my work are young people. And then the young people are like, oh, what is this about? And they're like, oh, early 2000s. And then they get obsessed with it, right? And then they end up like taking my spot and then like, you know, being inspired by what they grew up. And then that young generation is like, oh, what's that? What's what's NFTs? And then like, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's always like it's, it circulates. Totally. You know? It's totally circular. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, there there mm-hmm. is this huge mm-hmm. resurgence of the 90s right mm-hmm. now. And, and you were mentioning fashion, too. And it made me reflect on, I mean, I was an early, like I was a early teenager growing up in the 1990s. And um, I just remember fashion was was like kind of a bit wild and fun like I, mm-hmm. I remember what I was drawn to like mm-hmm. I loved the Delia's catalog mm-hmm. which I know was was mm-hmm. more for yeah. for girls yeah, yeah, yeah. but it was like kind of funky and quirky yeah. like almost 70s but different like yeah, 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 you know yeah. and yeah there's just a feeling that went along with 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 that mm-hmm. and uh yeah I'm wondering if if there there is a feeling that the young people want to feel right now mm. that was that existed in the yeah in the 90s. that too that too and i think like the thing with like things like coming back and like revolving around is that like the people who like the young people they only like pick out like certain parts right like like they're not picking out like the bad parts or like even some of the, the really really good parts they're like for some reason like obviously they're still influenced by the era that they live in so they're picking out the parts that kind of like are still um they feel like are still relevant to like the time that we live in now so it's kind of interesting like how some things come back and some things don't Mm. and it's based on still based on like today i guess and it's like interesting so you kind of see like oh why why are like teenage girls like dressing like this or like why when i go on tiktok like people are like oh this is early 2000s style but it's like but when I look at, I like, obviously I grew up in the early 2000s, but like when I look at like these TikToks of like early 2000s, I'm like, that is not what I wore, you know what I mean? Like, but I, but they're like, but the thing is like, they're like, the only thing they can archive is like, 
oh, like early 2000s hip hop music videos. And like, that's what they like reference, right? Yeah. But like at that time, that was like such an unattainable, like I couldn't dress like the rappers and like I couldn't dress like 50 Cent because I could have couldn't afford it, right? I was dressing completely different. But then like there's no way that a like a 20 year old kid right now could look at a photo of me or like everyday people in the early 2000s of how they actually dress. Yeah, yeah. Right? They can only look at like a 50 cent or like, um, you know, like like a Britney Spears or something and see how she dressed. But it's like very aspirational, you know, mm. what I mean? like to, to me growing up. It's like I could never I could have never dressed up like the Backstreet Boys because like I was like shopping at like blue notes or like you know you know like (laughs) something like that or like you know like the sale rack at american eagle or something like that you know what i mean so it's like i like but the young kids they don't they don't know that they don't see that so it's interesting like they pluck out from basically it's always like pop culture like kind of yeah yeah and then it becomes kind of like normalized today so it's like ah, it's like it's super interesting i mean those are the things that like yeah it reminds me of like music and Mm -hmm. how there's like sampling but then Mm -hmm. there's Mm -hmm. i think it's called interpolation Mm -hmm. where you're like you're taking yeah something from that already exists Mm -hmm. but you're you're changing Mm -hmm. it Mm -hmm. but you still know where it came from yeah yeah Yeah. kind of like that instead of like a full sample you know where you're just like plucking Mm -hmm. the entire thing yeah and i think it's like yeah with music it's definitely like super interesting like there's this genre of music that a lot of my young friends talk about it's called hyper pop but like uh but like when if if i were to play you a hype hyper pop song it's like basically like it's basically like um do you remember that song from back in the day that was called i'm blue yeah it's basically that but they call it but it's like this new genre of hyper pop because it's like fused between like a very sped up like pop sound of like back in the day those like weird songs like like I'm a Barbie girl like yeah. that those type oh, of beats yeah sped up and oh, we kind of, called that how like exactly it was some kind like of house it, yeah, for us, yeah. right? but now it's called hyper pop because it's fused mm. with like with like kind of maybe like R&B sounding vocals and mm-hmm. like hip hop um but it's those beats so I'm like so interesting what, so, yeah so like oh yeah this is hyper pop so i'm like so they're like this is hyper pop but i'm like so basically what you're saying to me is if i turn up the bpm on a craig david song that's hyper pop and they're like i'm like oh yeah that kind of, does kind of sound like hyper pop wow. like, yeah it's basically that's basically what it is so it's like it's kind of funny because like they'll be like yeah it'll be like these younger producers that are like obviously very inspired by like this house pop like electronic sound and they're transferring it to like something that is more digestible to people's ears today because they're like because like we if you heard like i'm a barbie girl like back in the day you would have never like imagined like some r&b singer to be on on that beat but nowadays it is you know what i mean so it's like so it's like yeah it's it's cool i it's, mean i think everything wild. gets repurposed and like yeah keeps it's it, an yeah, interpretation it's, cool. it's yeah, an yeah, interpretation yeah. of the, the generation yeah Mm. yeah it's really it's really cool it's very interesting but anyway anyways that's what i've like been observing like wow these types of things. i love i yeah. love learning these things yeah. i'm like yeah what's the next gen like what yeah. are they doing how are they yeah. thinking how are they moving mm-hmm. through the world i um i recently did um because i don't know if you know this but i'm also a certified sound therapy practitioner mm. so i end up doing um a sound bath for a gen z um group queer mm-hmm. community mm-hmm. and um, I usually send it in intake form mm-hmm. out to each individual so I can just mm-hmm. see what they're going through, what I can see in terms of patterns within the group as well so that I can best support them. And this group, out of any group that I've worked with over the two, more than two years now, they were the most open mm. and vulnerable about what they were going through. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and then even... Um, during the session, after the session, like how open they were to talking about it. And I could just tell that like, these are kids that are super in tune with their emotions Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and who they are at a much quicker pace than Mm -hmm. I was at that age. And that's just, that's Mm -hmm. just how they exist in the world and with each other. Super open. There was Mm -hmm. no, there was no doubt in their minds that they could say anything they wanted to say Mm -hmm, in that mm -hmm. room. Yeah. Yeah, that's, like, the interesting part, too, about the new generation is that, like, I also feel like it's, like, the internet playing a huge part where it's, like, like, before when I was growing up, I couldn't, 
I didn't have other forms and other spaces to let out my emotions besides like my journal or like um, a really, really close friend. Uh, but nowadays I feel like everybody's so open because like you're just like talking to this camera and then you're like posting it and then you don't know who's going to see it. But you're not really conscious about that. Like you're just talking to it and then you're just talking to this camera. You're basically talking to yourself, like looking at yourself and then you're just like, okay, I'm just going to post this. And then, mm. and then everybody else like kind of just like gives their feedback or whatever. And I think that like allows for more, I guess, like, like what you said, like not really being afraid to like, there's no like, like boundaries in how you want to like share your emotions. Because like, I think a lot of young people understand that like, like, it is what it is, basically. It's like mm. if you feel sad, like you should say you're sad. If you feel happy, you should share that you're happy. And there's no like, and everybody's conscious about like different types of experiences. And I think that's like, that's awesome. Yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. Like I, I felt very, I felt very inspired and humbled by mm. this group to, mm. to be yeah. honest. And uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's beautiful. Not that they're not going yeah. through their own difficulties mm. of, of being young mm. and particularly mm. yeah. the, the queer community and what yeah. they've gone through. Mm. Um, but you can just tell yeah. they just want to be who they are. Yeah. 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 And it's like, and it allows for each of them to like be able to help each other. Cause 100%. like, if you don't like, if they're like super open, it's like, Oh my, you know, I'm going through this with my sister or my brother. And like, they're not like, I guess back in the day, maybe you'd feel embarrassed if like, you had a certain situation with like your family member or like a really close friend, you would, wouldn't know who to tell, but now you're kind of like, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, this is what I'm going through. And I'm like, okay, this, we're going to help you. And it's like, that's so, cr that's yeah. so crazy. That's so sick. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to have your community, to yeah. have your chosen family, mm -hmm. like it, it, everyone mm -hmm. deserves something yeah, yeah. like that yeah. for sure. Yeah, so yeah, no, yeah. I, I feel like every generation, you know, that comes after us, we mm -hmm. can learn a ton Yeah. on, how to be a better mm -hmm. human. 100%. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'd love to go back to photography mm -hmm. and your journey into it mm -hmm. and also where you're at now because we mm -hmm. had such an interesting conversation mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. artist versus mm -hmm. photographer. Yeah. Um, but what I wanted to ask you is you were saying that you're doing a lot of mentoring mm -hmm. and that you are helping people sort of really hone in on what their point of view is or mm -hmm. like what their gift is and what they can share. Mm -hmm. um, do you, how do you do that? Do you have sort of a process around it or do, is it like an intuitive thing mm. that you know, like once you get to know them, you're like, oh, that's what I can help bring out of you. Yeah. I think it's just like asking them like what type of people they are, what they enjoy, what do they, why did they decide to do photography and like, um, what do they enjoy about like their art? Like what makes them feel good? What makes them feel not good? What makes them feel self-doubt and stuff like that? And like, getting to know them and where they're at, I'm able to like kind of assess like, yeah, like what areas I think that they could be encouraged in or like be brought up in. And I think like most of it is like, like I'm not even really teaching photography because like technical skills is like, it's easy to learn. Like we can go and learn lighting and all that stuff, but it's like kind of like re, um, reframing like their mindset to how they think about themselves like as artists and what they value and i think like every artist every photographer if you go into art like it's not wrong it's not wrong at all to like want to pursue something because you think it'll give you stability financial stability and that's that's cool and i think that's fine because i feel everybody wants to reach a certain level of financial stability to be able to live their lives i mean that's how we <laughs> stay alive like in the world um but i try to but i try to let them know or let them know that like hey like um it's cool that you want to pursue like financial stability with this art form i mean i'm doing that too but at the same time it's like um like um it's kind of just like asking them like what their what what their values are when it comes to like like how they, I guess, like what the relationship is with like finance, what the relationship is with like um, how that balances out with art. Like, how does that affect them? Like, are you like, like I meet a lot of like younger photographers who are like, oh, I can't seem to like make a living out of this. And I'm like, I'm like, maybe you need to reframe what it is that like what your 
what your view of like living is because for me like all i value financially is to be able to like pay for my rent and save a little bit of money give a little bit of money to my parents and buy a coffee every day and that's all i really want out of life if i can't do one out of the four of those things then i'm i feel like i'm in trouble <laughs> you know that's what i'm like ooh like what's going on you know but like but um but I think most people like try to carry this like uh, most um, people who come come into art they they um, or want to pursue photography or want to pursue art they come in with like the mindset of like oh I can live the same way that my friend who is a doctor lives by doing this mm -hmm. but if you want to be realistic like you can't there's like a very small percentage of photographers that can live like that but most of us can't and that's just the reality of it and there's nothing and i think that's like and i and like maybe that's like a discouraging to some people but it's like okay well then maybe maybe you shouldn't be a photographer because maybe your values in life don't align with like this craft that i think you, sh you should be spending more time on like like the craft than like than worrying about like how you're gonna do this this and this like you know and it's okay that like you can still be a photographer you can still take photos as a hobby or maybe you can still like you know do it as a side side thing and that's really cool because if it still fuels like your creative spirit then definitely do it but if you're not willing to like if you're not willing to like make certain decisions and make certain adjustments um with your with your life and how you like live according to like what you're like kind of like trying to pursue or like trying to care about then like i don't know there's got to be some like for me there's always got to be some like give and take when it comes to that and i try to like mentor these younger photographers like in that mindset because like yeah like sometimes like like it's sometimes like yeah maybe this just is like I'm doing this full time or as a career like it's not for you or maybe you just need to make certain decisions that will help you get to the things that you want to do you know what i mean mm -hmm. if you want to live like your friend who's like a doctor then maybe you need to do photography and maybe you need to work somewhere else too and like that's cool and that's totally fine because if you're like if you're a photographer and you're also like working other some other part-time job that doesn't make you any less of a of a photographer than someone who's doing it full-time like and I think that's another like frame of mind that I try to mm. like teach like them as well. Yeah, that's yeah. A, that's an important one too. Yeah. yeah, not to see that you know having to maybe split your yeah. time between things yeah. as a, as a failure. Yeah. You still have an avenue of expression. 100%. Yeah, and that will probably fill you in other ways that the other thing yeah. is not. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. that like yeah, I mean that's something that I've been saying a lot like these days, like especially to like younger photographers and my peers it's like hey like it's not a failure if like i think sometimes like um like we kind of hype each other up as artists and be like oh you're able to do this full time like that's amazing like you made it and it's like yeah like true but at the same time like there's also nothing wrong at all with like still doing your art and working somewhere else you know what i mean and doing something completely different yeah because like you still made it regardless. Like if you're able to like do that, like to me, like you still are, you still made it to me, you know, just because you're not doing full time. Like that's fine. Nobody's doing anything full time. That's, you know, <laughs> and that's such an important, I'm really, really happy mm. that you brought that up even just for, for me too. Like just to mm. even sit in that, um, because you just take this pressure off mm. yourself of 100%. being like, Oh yeah, I'm a failure if I'm not doing mm. this fully. Mm. And maybe there's just a longer road to get there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. maybe there's just another like uh, configuration mm -hmm. of how it's done for yeah. you. Yeah. I feel mm -hmm. like when I was getting into photography, that's something that I was like really um, conscious about too. I'm like, well, man, I do want to do this full time and maybe I'm not like that great of a photographer or whatever. But I kind of saw that as something that's like, well, let me look at my life first. Like what's the most like, what's the, what's like real for me? Like I have to like outside of like, like honing my craft, like 
like there's live. other you yeah there's other things yeah, that yeah. i need to do to mm-hmm. live so the first like five six years of me like being a photographer i was working like two other jobs at the same time because i just like wanted to live and i i valued different things back then like i wanted to like you know if my friends wanted to go to mexico i'm like okay i need money to go to mexico to like party with my friends you know so those are the things that i valued at the time so i had to i knew i had to make certain adjustments with my life to like do that so i was like working as a nurse i was also working in retail and then after i would be like make some time for photography and at at the same and like i personally didn't want to like put any financial pressure on me trying to get to know myself as an artist and i think that like really Mm -hmm. blocks people these days like these days like being a photographer seems so easy like you just start posting photos on instagram maybe you get a lot of followers maybe you get posting stuff on tiktok and then you blow up and then you're a photographer right but that's like that's just like what we see that's like what gets fed to us but there's like for every like one person that you see blow up on tiktok there's like a thousand people trying to do that that are not blowing up on tiktok you know what i mean so so it's like it's like yeah like you have to i don't know like i think that kind of putting that financial like pressure on yourself to like while you're like still getting to know yourself like as an artist and like and you're not even as technically sound as you want to be like i would always tell people like yo it's okay if you just want to like work like a part-time job so you can like fund your creative things and like take the pressure off of you like learning how to make really learning how about yourself like as an artist that way you can make more meaningful work that means something to you and you can find something that you want to say find the patterns in your own life in your own world for you to figure out what it is that you want to say so you can say that like so you can make art that you actually intentionally want to like give to people not just like you're just doing it because Mm. like you know you gotta you have to do it to like live yeah and then you end up like you end up actually getting to the place that you want to go slower than a person who's like working like at Starbucks and like doing photography on the side. Yeah. You know? And you know, what if you end up hating it because there's exactly, so much pr- yeah. pressure on this, this yeah. thing to be the yeah. only thing. Yeah. And you're just like, it's, I don't love it actually yeah. anymore yeah. because it's just yeah. gone down this road. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I think I that's happened to like a lot of people that I've met where they just like, I'm like no no I can make it I can make it and I'm like okay cool like I said what I wanted to say but like okay if you want to go this way that's cool but at the end of the day like I like I would want you to like keep loving like what it is that you do and don't lose like the thing that like drew drew you to it mm. just because like now you can't like make a living off of it you know yeah what I mean? but it's like yeah it's like weird it's like you're just kind of like jumping into the deep end like right away and I feel like like some some people maybe like they enjoy like the sink or swim nature of like life but for me like i'm really slow paced Mm -hmm. person and i have to like be um i have to feel a certain level of like uh readiness yeah and like while i was like getting into photography i did a bunch of like free stuff and i did that because i knew that i was like learning and even though i was probably like my friends were like these are really great photos like you should charge for them and i'm like i don't know i don't feel like ready to take people's money for this i just personally i just don't feel ready for it and i think like yeah maybe i missed out on a lot of like money but i think in the end like i was uh i'm like like happy that i took like that route because like i feel very um um for me i feel very like secure no matter what decision I decide to make, like, with my art, like, if I want to take a break for a year, then I feel so fine with that because I know that this is just, like, a step into me, like, like going further, I guess. Even though it might feel to some people that you're like, oh, so you're not taking any photos at all? I'm like, no. But, like, I'm still a photographer yeah. nonetheless. I mean, it's still a process for me to, like, not touch a camera and like think about myself and the world around me and like taking a step back and like figuring out like like i i never want to like waste like nowadays like i don't really want to like waste like um like my time like making art that's just like looks good like everybody's art looks good there's a lot of beautiful work out there 
but like like why why look at like my beautiful work you know what i mean it's like there's so many people making beautiful work so i'd rather like take the time to like make work and think about work that i intentionally am giving to someone so that i know that it's strong enough for that person to look at it and feel like they left with something or left something there mm. you know what i mean so i don't know that's just that's just how i feel <laughs> yeah, no i think that's i mean i think it's a really beautiful perspective on it um there's kind of like a there's a confidence in that mm. that um to know that, yeah, it's okay if I take a break. I, I was thinking as you were saying that, um, just about creative flow, mm -hmm. and it doesn't, you know, it's not like a never-ending tap, you know, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it's just going to keep on channeling yeah. through you. It's like yeah. sometimes you just mm -hmm. need to take a break and yeah. and shut it off and like let it build again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that like take like um, I guess like culture and society, like they kind of look at like work in a, like an athlete perspective perspective like going back to like sports like it's like like yeah like someone like a lebron james like this dude's like nearing his last days and he's like a unicorn like not many people get to play at like 37 years old as great as he does but most nba players are done by like they're probably like over the hill by like the time they're 34 because it's their body right it's their body that can't keep up if they were like robots they could play forever right but i think sometimes like young people or a lot of people like pursuing art they take that mindset with them the same mindset that you would be if you were you know trying to like be the youngest like like partner in your firm for like a lawyer you know what I mean? like they want that they want everything like super quick and that's a crazy goal and it's awesome if when people achieve it but i don't think you should bring that mindset when you're doing art because like some people who are lawyers doctors whatever like their bodies are gonna fail them sports at their bodies are going to fail them like surgeons their hands are going to start shaking and they won't be able to operate anymore but art you can do that forever hmm. so like it's like and like you might not be a photographer ever maybe like maybe you find yourself being a graph designer or a painter or a sculptor or like a set designer or something like that but you can do that forever until the your very very last like waking moment you're an artist and so, like, you should look at, like, your career as an artist in that length, not like, oh, I got to get everything done before my prime. And it's like, what is your prime? Like, if you look at, like, the best photographers right now, the most legendary photographers, they're like, how old is, like, Anne Leibovitz, right? Like, yeah. she's, like, 70 or something. I don't even know. Like, Bill Cunningham, legendary guy. Yeah. Probably didn't even get as much attention as he should have got until he was, like, 60. Yeah, totally. So it's like... Like, even, like, musicians, right? Like, even musicians, like, sure, like, they pass away. Like, RIP Bobby Caldwell yesterday, you know? But, like, look how many people are, like, listening to Bobby Caldwell right now. You know what I mean? And it's, like, like your length as an artist, like, is your entire life. So, like, even though I, I am, like, mentoring young photographers, they're just young people, I'm still a young photographer, like, with them, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Because I'm going to be a photographer. Hopefully, I live till I'm, like, 70, 80 years old, and I'm, I'll, hopefully, I'll still be taking photos then. But yeah. I feel like I, I'm confident that I'm taking really, really, like, my best photography, like, right now. Yeah. But I'm excited of what my photography is going to look like when I'm 60. And I don't think that, like, I think that I'll still, like, I won't be, I'm not, like, sad about that fact you know what i mean i'm not gonna be sad about like oh well i'm not gonna blow up to like even if like something in my head or like you know god or morgan freeman came down <laughs> and told me like hey sorry um you're actually not gonna blow up until you're 71 i'm gonna be like sick you know what i mean because like that's cool with me you know what i mean that's totally that's fine many more years of experience exactly to collect along the way to me it's kind of like whoa, I'm going to blow up when I'm 71. So like, I'm probably like, I'm looking at it like, holy smoke. So like, I, my career is going to go up until I'm like 71 yeah, and beyond. Yeah, yeah. So like, I don't know. I feel like, yeah, some people look at like their, the art career, the same length of time as like a person who is like a surgeon or a athlete. 
but well, there's a lot of ageism, just yeah, f- exactly, quite frankly, yeah. right? Like, yeah. I'm you're talking about this. I'm thinking about Michelle Yeoh and how mm-hmm. she yeah. she won her first Oscar. Yeah. I mean, incredible. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a lot of nuances along yeah. the way, along yeah. why it maybe took that yeah. long. Yeah. Um, but I loved what she said in the end, where she was like, "Don't let anyone tell you mm-hmm. that you know that you're past your prime." Mm-hmm. And I think that's great. I mean, one of my favorite podcasters, Rich Roll. Mm-hmm. I mean, he didn't blow up with his pod, didn't write his first book, like all the mm-hmm. things that have made him um, more publicly recognized mm-hmm. to like 45 to 50. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even like like acting, even like Michelle Yeoh, it's kind of like, yeah, like you might have not blown up when you're playing like a teenager or you're playing some young adult, yeah. but like your roles and your craft like change like as you age and you kind of come into that and the confidence in that, right? It's like Michelle Yeoh, like, like she probably should have like i don't know like she play has played many many great roles right but like she just happened to like you know win her oscar at this time yeah in this role that she embraced you know maybe yes. she maybe she's not looking at it at, at her career like i should have definitely like i'm like i don't like i don't i wish i didn't win this oscar for playing some old mother you know what i mean oh some old like um mom but like she's like i definitely should have won when i was you know, doing like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I'm I'm not going to look at my art being like, oh, I should have blown up when I was like doing that like collage back of the day. But mm. like, but I'd be happy like wherever I'm at, like whenever people decide to discover my art or when I am, I don't know, if it is in my cards to like, quote unquote, like blow up, then like I'll be happy whenever that day comes. But I think I'm just happy like making art and like, discovering that process and growing in that process and being excited that like there's better things Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. that I'm going to make and I'm happy that like I'm like um like present Mm. yeah 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 Yeah, I wanted to ask you because it was something that came up in our, our last conversations together about you feeling um more like an artist than uh a photographer in mm. in some ways and i want to know like how are you feeling about that like where are you sitting with mm. that right now at this point in your life where you're kind of taking a bit of a a break a little mm. bit of a, a step back i mean i know you're still working yeah. but you're also saying no to a lot mm. of things yeah i think like uh i always like had this view of like an artist being like a i don't know like a like a brooding, like a kind of like emo, like type person, or maybe it's, I feel like calling myself an artist felt like very, uh, uh, what's the word? Like pretentious. Um, because like when I look at people who call themselves artists, I look at like, yeah, I look at people like Warhol and Basquiat and like those type of people, like fine artists. And I don't think I was like really making that. I don't think I still am like really making that kind of work. Like I'm like mainly like a, fashion editorial photographer and i'm like okay i don't know if that, i mean yeah i guess it's art but like i don't know if i call myself an artist but um one of my really close friends uh jeremy lee who's a photographer as well he's always like telling me oh you're an artist you're an artist i'm like what does that even mean i mean like your photos are crazy like you're an artist yes shout you know? out jeremy Julie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but i've started to realize that like like yeah i think like uh, being an artist i think like what Jeremy was trying to tell me that it like goes beyond like the actual medium that it's more about like, that's more about like how, yeah, how you're observing the world and how you communicate and you get to like figure out like what it is and yeah. how it is you communicate it like, to the world. What's your point of view? Yeah. What's your point of view? And I think that like, there are a lot of photographers out there, people who like click and click the photo and, um, you know, I meet a lot of people who are like, oh, yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm pretty, I'm, I take photos, I'm pretty good at photos or whatever. And they do take very beautiful photos. But like, uh, I guess, I, I mean, it's no disrespect to any of them, because everybody has a place in, in their world. And I'm not forcing anybody to like, think so deeply about like their art. But yeah, I don't know, I feel like I, I am always consciously whether or not it is something as seasonal as a fashion editorial, like, I try to like, offer some sort of perspective some sort of story or some sort of emotion that people can like resonate with even if i'm just trying to sell them a dress or like a t-shirt or a pair of shoes you know what i mean it's important for me to be able to communicate that and there's other people that don't think about that at all 
And I think I've like embraced more and more like the, the act of like, like being conscious of that. And I think I've always been that, but I've always been like afraid to be like, to kind of like, um, say it out loud, I guess. Mm. I'd always be like, yeah, I'm a photographer. And then they'd, and then I would be, when I would tell people like, oh yeah, I'm a photographer. Like they would, no, no offense to them, but they would always compare me to like some, some photographer that like I would hate to be compared to because I'm like, no, 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 that's not what I am. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't do that. That's not me. Mm-hmm. And, um, but then I, in my head, I'm like, but what, what is, what is me? Like, why, why am I, why do I feel so offended that this person's comparing me to that? And, and I started to realize like, oh, I think it's because like, I think it's because like, I care like so much. And I care like so much about like my art where I look at someone who's like, um, I don't know, making a certain type of art or like moving in a certain way that or making work that I don't like um, feel then like that I'm like, oh, like, I don't know. I don't really resonate with that. I don't like I, I immediately like try to like tell that person that like, oh, no, it's like I don't do that. You know, I don't like do that thing that you think that I'm doing. Like, yeah, I do. I do take pictures, but like, that's not like how I do it. That's not how I think about it. And it's like, and so like, I don't know, that's like how I've been kind of like differentiating myself and who I am like as a artist, like Mm. compared to how I thought about myself before. Mm. Yeah. What do you think your point of view is? I think my point of view is like, I don't know, actually, that's a really good question. I don't know if I, I've even, like, like fully processed that question. But I think, um, I think my point of view is just, like, is, I think I'm just trying, I think I'm just trying to make um, honest, like, work, like, what's honest, like, to myself. Like, I'm all, I've always been, like, a, a realist. I'm like, I do like have a lot of dreams and I like daydream like a lot, but like, I'm very like, um, real when it comes to like, um, my life and how I approach stuff. I, I never want, like, I'm never good at like, like I love writing, but I'm never good at like writing fiction. Like, I don't know how to write like made up stories of made up people and like, um, and like, uh, who have like wings and like vampire teeth and stuff like that. Like, I don't know how to like turn that into something. Like I always have to relate, relate my work to something that I've felt or something that my mother's felt or something that my friend has felt something that I've experienced like firsthand and like touched and like um, shared emotions with. And like, I think, um, I think that's, um, and I think I try to put, that out as best as I can, like in my work, but my work also was, it also includes a lot of writing and I do include a lot of that in like my writing. And I think that like, um, I think that I'm just trying to share like what's honest, like, like with me at the time, like that I'm living. Mm-hmm. And, um, I always want to be conscious of like how my views and my perspectives and my values like change. And I try to communicate like, um, I think my, I guess like overall, like I'm just trying to communicate like that, like, um, like being of just like being like a human being and basically just like allowing people uh, showing through my work and my words, like allowing people that like they can, they can change and they can, and it, it's okay. Mm-hmm. I think like a lot of my perspectives and my values and my personality like has differed and changed and changed back. And like, I think that um, sometimes everybody can be very judgmental and rigid towards each other where it's kind of like, oh, well, what, wait a second. Like, I, th- I thought you said you didn't like Beyonce. <laughs> and so, and so I was like, well, I'm like, no, I love Beyonce now. You know what I mean? And I think some people might look at a little thing like that and be like, ooh, that's a, like a little dishonest of you. But I'm like, no, it's not. It's like you, you wouldn't allow like your a person to change their mind, you know? And I think that everybody has like, should be allowed and have the room to like, um, not be conscious of like changing, changing their mind when they know that like something has affected them that like has changed their mind in the good or bad ways too. So I'm like, 
I don't know. I'm just trying. That's like kind of like what I try to communicate like a lot that is like, hey, like this is part of like being like mm. a human being is to change your mind. Totally. And, yeah. yeah. And I feel like what you said about Beyonce too, like mm. it's like she's evolved as a person and an <laughs> artist as well. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, you can't limit artists yeah. to their own box, to yeah. a box yeah. either. Yeah. I think like the, the, I think, I guess like, like the people that I was like really drawn to, like growing up were always people that had like, um, that had like a yin and yang and they're like loud about it. Like my people that I looked up to a lot were like growing up were like Tupac and, Allen Iverson, basketball player, mm. Dennis Rodman, Mike Tyson. And like, um, these are people that like I looked up to because they were like so like, I think a lot of people judge them so hard for one side. But hey, that, that's just like, that's who they are too. But that doesn't cancel out the fact that like they're, they're also this person, you know. I feel like Tupac especially, right? Like he'll make a song like Hit Him Up, but then he'll also but he's have also a song. poet. Yeah, but he's know? like, amazing artist you know what i mean mm -hmm. he'll have like um so many great songs that talk about a lot of things and yeah people can have these like kind of like like balances in their life and i think like everybody should be allowed to like have that leeway to like think and feel that way mm -hmm. and maybe they're not going to be as out loud about it as someone like tupac or like a dennis rodman or something like that but i love that like i love like i love like um showing people that like you can you can um like you don't have to be so like rigid with yourself and choose and feel like you have to choose this for the rest of your life because like something could happen in your life and it could completely rock your world and i would i would hate for anyone to feel like they gotta hold themselves back because like the world is telling them that they can't feel that way or be that way mm. but it's like well your whole world is changing and you want to change with it, but you're afraid that like people might not like you because of this person that you want to become or that you're becoming. Mm. I feel like, like, I would hate that for anyone. So I try to like communicate that in my work. It's like, hey, it's, it's cool. Like I know a lot of photographers who will like come up with a new style and they will like delete the rest of their Instagram. But mm. I like to keep like everything that I do like on there. I like to see where for people to like scroll on my instagram and be like whoa yeah, <laughs> i used it's to like, take it's yeah. a history of yeah, you yeah like, no, right? i used to take like these kind of photos i used to edit it this kind of way and it's a document for me too mm -hmm, to see mm -hmm. how much i've changed and how much like i've grown and like seeing these benchmarks of like and seeing like certain photos where it's like whoa i was really like trying something here and then it turned into this and i think that's like really beautiful mm. and i think that i try to like show that like with my own work and through my words and try to like relate that to like how people can also be like that like as humans yeah. yeah yeah it's so important i mean we're also we're also nuanced no and, and you just you don't you don't want to stay the same like yeah. why why yeah. would you yeah. um like stunt uh your evolution yeah. like that but yeah. i i get it it can be scary because yeah. when you evolve and when you change mm -hmm. um things around you will change yeah. too yeah. you know like you yeah. might have friends for mm -hmm. example mm -hmm. that suddenly you've evolved in a certain way and mm -hmm. suddenly your values or like what you're yeah. interested in yeah. don't really align anymore mm -hmm. and then there's going to be the grieving portion mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. oh my god like this person i was close to i just i don't feel yeah. that anymore yeah. Yeah. and be maybe people are afraid of that mm -hmm. yeah um, I think, and so it's just easier to stay the same yeah i think it's like when you're an artist too like especially when you get like known for something it's like you know you want to change but then you have this kind of like Shtick. weird like yeah. pressure that's like oh well people like this new thing that i do or like what if it flops or like what if people don't like it or like oh maybe i'll just like keep doing this thing that i actually don't want to do is like really good i mean like i feel like um I, yeah i mean i feel like that's why like i love like people like kanye like so much because like people are always like oh i love like i love the old kanye when he used to make like this type of music and stuff but like i love like his journey through music and how he's like been very un unapologetic with the stuff that he's put out because it's like, well, whatever. Like this is, he's like, well, this is what I'm on. And like, I'm going to put this out because it's honest to me. And I would hate for anybody to like, be like, oh, like, yeah, like, like I'm just doing this. Cause like, yeah, this is what everybody wants from me. And I'm like, I mean, 
geez, like, have you, have you never watched any shows on Family Channel? Like, you're not supposed to do this. <laughs> like, you're not, like, you know, like, you're supposed to, like, change. And if you feel so strongly about doing this new thing, like, you should go do it. And that's the whole point. That's the whole point of, like, mm-hmm. growing, I guess, like that. You don't want to, like, box yourself in because other people are telling you, like, yeah, yeah. oh, or, or this is what I'm known for, so I should just keep doing this. It's like, well, nobody gets to, like, win an Oscar or a Grammy or, like, you know, have the things they want by like just doing the same thing over and over mm-hmm. and over you know what i mean as an artist i guess but yeah, you don't I mean, really want to want that what yeah, if yeah, in, yeah. in the end like yeah. if, if you can and you have the means yeah. like and even yeah. if it doesn't go the way yeah. you want yeah then you can at least say oh you know what i gave it a shot yeah 100 percent. i mean i think that's like how i also approach like just like being an artist too i always tell my friends i'm like i don't know like i'm like yeah i'm, I'm gonna take photos like for now but like I don't know, I might do something, like, later. Mm. I might do something else mm-hmm. later. I might give up photography, like, later and just do it for fun. Because, like, I don't know, like, my interests change and I learn different things and maybe I want to make clothes later. Maybe I just, like, want to, like, get into the art of coffee later. You know what I mean? Like, I just be a barista and, like, open a coffee shop or something yeah. like that. Like, maybe I want to do that. But, like, I have to, like, like, be open in my mind to allow myself to be, like, well, like, yeah, that's what I want to do. Mm. And I don't want to be conscious of being, like, oh, well, well, yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't really like Donnell anymore because he's not a photographer or whatever. I'm like, that's fine, that's cool. Like, well, there's a lot more other people who are gonna like me as a barista too, so it's chill. <laughs> so it's fine. And that's what, and that's yeah. what's calling you at, at the yeah, moment. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, that's it's cool. A-okay. If you want to like stay and reminisce about Donnell the photographer, then be my guest. It's cool. There's gonna be a lot of work there that you can look back at and be like, awesome. But <laughs> I'll hey, be here I'm, behind the coffee bar. Exactly. It's like, hey, but hey, I'm Maybe making coffee you. now, so. Mm-hmm. If you want an ice mm-hmm. americano, I could get that for you. You know, so I love that. Yeah. Oh, well, I have a couple of questions for mm-hmm. you. Just a couple of last questions. Um, you were you had mentioned to me that mm-hmm. when you were getting into photography, you had met some twins mm-hmm. who had, and I I think they're yeah. still your friends. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And they really kind of opened up your world to mm-hmm. like art and fashion. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm just wanted to know what you would want to say to them right now about where they where they contributed to your life's journey mm, man um yeah i met these two twins I, I i was like working at starbucks in college and one of the twins was working with me and then his brother was going to school for graph design and he would be doing his homework all the time at the coffee shop and yeah i feel i felt like super like connected to them and like we were just like and we would just like hang out all the time, just like as friends. And I was just kind of like learning like a whole bunch of stuff from them. And I was pretty like, I was pretty like, I was just lis- listening to like, no- I guess in my head, like normal music, like R&B, hip hop, like just popular, like pop music basically. But they really showed me like different things. Like they they were obviously like very, um, they were both in art school, so they were very, they were being exposed to so many different things. So different things that I I didn't know about. And I think through them, I like learned more about like what art is and how expansive like it is. And it's not so as rigid as I thought it would be. And like, and like how possible it is to like pursue that. I didn't know like the process behind like, like, uh, like, I would look at, like, a bus stop ad, right, on the bus stop. But I wouldn't recognize that as photography, right? And that's and when I met them, I would be, like, I started to see things as, like, art, you know? Like, I look at, like, like these magazine covers, like, behind you. Like, that's graphic design, right? But to me, I would have just been, like, that's a magazine cover. But before, but after I met them, I started to see, like, the process of, like, how that a thing is made. And that's kind of what really, like, open my world up of like exploring art more and I really thank them like a lot for like the the honestly it felt like a billion years that we were together but we were like spending pretty much every waking moment like together all the time every day doing young boy stuff <laughs> and like um and yeah man I mean I I thank them as much as I can like in every like conversation that I have with people I always mention them and even like for them, whenever I talk to them, I always tell them how much, like, they've impacted, like, my life in terms of, like, the trajectory of my life. I don't think I would have been able to explore the things in art that I would have explored if they never exposed it to me. I think I would have still been happy in my life, but I would be 
I would have would have been really been an artist. And I think like they were kind of like that care figure that I was talking about at the beginning of this conversation where they saw something in me that they're like, oh yeah, like, you know, you should do this and you should do this or you should try this or yo, take this camera, like you should take pictures. And I'm like, they weren't like forcing it on me, but I feel like they saw something that I was doing and they just allowed me to have the space and encouraged me to do it, which like kind of like, yeah, which kind of like opened me up to like keep pursuing that like weird feeling that I had in my like, like I always grew up categorizing myself as creative, but like why though? And I think they really helped me discover like the why. Yeah. 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 Sometimes you'll meet people in your life and, you know, they'll do something like that. Mm -hmm. They'll like create a nurturing environment or some encouragement or sometimes someone will just say Mm -hmm. like a sentence or observe something about you. And yeah, then the the trajectory of of things will change. I mean, with this podcast, um, there was an old colleague of mine, him and I had went to coffee and I'd already been sort of thinking about this. This is probably two and a half, almost three years ago. And um, was talking about this podcast that I wanted to do. And after I, you know, told him all the things, Mm -hmm. um, he just looked at me straight in the eye and he said, I don't know if you know this, Mm -hmm. but when you talk about this, your eyes light up. So Mm -hmm. I think you need to go home and write a plan. Yeah. And I did that night. (laughs) I did. And it started to come together. And like, this is what it is now. And I'm just, I'm so grateful to him. I'm so like fulfilled that I get to do Mm -hmm. this. Um, but yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. all it took was him just to make that observation mm-hmm. yeah. about me yeah. and changed, you know, or at least pushed me along this mm-hmm. path a little bit mm-hmm. further. So yeah, I get it. I get yeah. those people who are sort of like open a portal in you yeah. in a way. Yeah, 100%. So, you uh, know, shout out. To, shout outs to those people. Yeah, shout out to Paulo and Francis Garcia, <laughs> my brothers. Nice, <laughs> love it. Um, so two more questions. Mm-hmm. Um, when we were having um, our chat a couple of weeks ago, mm. you'd mentioned to me that um, you had released a project two years ago that said everything that you'd wanted to say at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, what is it that you said with that project? Um, it was like, it was a bit of what we were talking about earlier, like being able to change your mind. But most of it was also, um, it was like, I don't know what I would categorize it, but like, I guess it was like a, heritage product project it's about like i wanted to say something about like what it meant to me being filipino and i think that like i think at that time like in 2019 2020 a lot like during the pandemic a lot of people were really exploring and like diving into that question of what it means to be who they are and what their heritage is and stuff like that and growing up like i never had any problems like i never Fortunately for me, I had never experienced any like um, racism or anything of like that towards like my culture, or, like being Asian or being Filipino. It's pretty fortunate in that. Um, I always thought that being Filipino was cool, but like for some reason, growing up, a lot of other Filipinos that I grew up with didn't think that. They didn't really think that it was cool. I don't know why they didn't think it was cool. I never questioned it, but I always just questioned like, oh, why is it that I think it, being Filipino is cool? And I think um, I started to, I go back to the Philippines pretty frequently, like every three or four years. So I have like a pretty good um, gauge on like what my cousins, what my family and my friends in the Philippines, what their lives are like there and what my life like is here. And I was trying to explore like the relationship between like Filipinos, like everywhere. I mean, I would meet so many different Filipinos like everywhere that I traveled, like in the States and in Asia and like in Europe and stuff like that. And like, I would just like ask them about their experience and stuff like that. And I think, um, I think that, um, yeah. And I think what I was trying to say in that project was that like, was, um, how how would I sum it up? Basically, I was just saying that like, hey, like, it's okay that like, it's okay that if you like, don't speak the language, you don't really eat the food. Maybe you don't feel like connected to like, the homeland like it doesn't make you like any less of a filipino than some person in manila you know what i mean i think like it wasn't my choice to come to canada right it wasn't my parents came here i it wasn't that girl living in the suburbs of indiana it wasn't her choice to move there you know what i mean and we kind of 
made our own. I didn't have an example of how to grow up. I didn't have an example of how to be a Filipino or I didn't have an example of how to grow up as like a Filipino kid in North America or a Filipino photographer. I didn't have that example. I just kind of made it my own. And like, I just, and I think it's just like embracing that and knowing that like, hey, like whatever you're doing like right now, like don't feel like it's out of like the box. It is out of the box. And I feel like whatever it is that you're doing doing now, like that is like a Filipino thing. You know what I mean? That is part of Filipino culture where we live here in North America. And I wouldn't want anybody to feel bad about like, oh, well, like when you grow up in your certain environments that you're not growing up around, like, I guess your culture, you're going to like be a melting pot of so many different things. So, but I don't think that makes you any less of a, of who you are like as like an Asian person or as a Filipino person. And I think I wanted to like, with that project, I wanted to instill that kind of confidence in young Filipino people or like people who grew up here that like, hey, it's okay if you like country music because if that's what you grew up on, that's who you are, that doesn't change the fact that you're Filipino. If you want to be a country music star, then country music is a Filipino thing. If I'm a photographer, being a photographer is a Filipino thing. Having a podcast is a Filipino thing because you haven't seen that before. So how would you know if it's a Filipino thing or not? You're already Filipino. So whatever you do is a Filipino thing. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I think I wanted to like tell that to a lot of my friends because like they would obviously a lot of people like, oh, my mom wants me to be a nurse or like my mom wants or my parents want this. And it's like, yeah, that's cool. But it's like, and you can do that if you want, but like, but there's so many other things that we can explore um, that you can be and don't be like discouraged by like, I guess like what Filipinos in this country have already kind of like mm. built. Like Filipinos are known for being nurses or barbers or dancers or whatever, but it's like, you don't have to do that. Like explore deep into yourself and get to know the things that you want to do. And don't be afraid that like, if it's calling you to be like, I don't know, like a marine biologist or like a barista. If you love coffee that much, you should go do that. You know what I mean? And like, and that's how, like, that's how we get to the levels. That's how we get into, that's how like Filipino people or Asian people like get into like Black Panther levels. You know what mm. I mean? And I think like I, I, I look, because a lot of my, my idols and the people that I were looking up to were African-American, I would see like the, 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 the like their journey of how expansive like their their like um i guess personalities and stuff like have become like back then it was people like tupac like let's just like look at hip-hop for example it was like tupac back then and then it was like you know and then it turned into like a 50 cent and then it turned into like i don't know like a jay-z and then a jay-z turned into like lil wayne and then now we have lil everybody's and young everybody and we have like future and play by cardi and like all these like different types of people that look different that sound different that grew up in different places that they're not just from like poor areas like Lil Yachty is like from the suburbs you know what I mean there's like all these people making different stuff we have people like Donald Glover and we have people like you know like future at the same time you know what I mean and I feel like um they like I feel like African Americans like they explored like that and they mm. like branched out and they're like confident and like doing the things that they want to do and be themselves and i want the same thing for filipino people because we're just as talented and diverse as everybody else like everybody like all types of people are that are as diverse but they just need to be have that like kind of like, like voice in the yeah voice yeah. in their head telling them like hey you can like dye your hair purple pink and green at the same time if you want mm. you know what i mean and no one's going to make you feel like you're like a weirdo filipino person or whatever you know because you don't have a like you know you don't have a skin fade and a sleep back and a comb over or something like that you yeah, know what i mean yeah. or like it's fine it's fine and i think that like i was trying to show that i was trying trying to show that in my own life and i wanted to transfer that into a project that helped like tell my friends and my peers that like hey like 
it's all good mm-hmm. you know what i mean like whatever you're doing however you're feeling like pursue that and I like that. and don't feel like you need to like don't feel bad about yourself that you don't know the language or whatever like that's stuff that you can like learn go buy a filipino cookbook and learn how to make sinigang or whatever you know like go, go, buy like a filipino dictionary and learn the basic stuff that's stuff that you can learn but like you're like but i don't want people to feel bad because they don't know yeah. you know what i mean and like it's not your fault that you don't know because your parents too were trying to learn english too so like just give us some grace yeah, for yeah, it's yourself like it's, and it's, the culture. Yeah, it's nobody's whatever. fault that you don't know this stuff because your parents were trying to acclimate too to survive. So mm-hmm. like, you know, if they were telling you like you got to learn like perfect English because like you you we need you to have a good job and blah 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 and like that's totally fine, you know. And I think that a lot of a lot of my peers and my Filipino friends were kind of feel like they were feeling a little bit insecure, maybe embarrassed about that, and maybe some of some of my friends were feeling conscious about the things that they enjoyed and the things that they liked because it wasn't something that maybe our other friends were into or mm-hmm. whatever. And maybe like I've experienced like some of my friends like, um, you know, being outcasted from a friend group because they're into something different. And it's like, well, that's weird. Like, that's weird. Like they're just exploring, like the exploring the things of why, like, like, why we're here in North America to be able to do these things, you know what I mean? Mm. To be able to like do these, yeah, to be able to do these things. They're just exploring the same way that I felt like I was exploring. Yeah. And because I didn't, I was, I had the room to explore. I didn't really, like I said before, like I didn't have like people judging me or like whatever. I didn't, I never really had like a close friend group like growing up. So I didn't have people like telling me like oh you should be like this you should be like this i was just allowed to be myself so i kind of wanted to like make this project to instill that thing and like my friends no matter like what age they are yeah like, just, just go giving room thing. for people yeah yeah exactly i but, like that i like that a yeah, lot i thought that would be a more like brief explanation but... no that's great <laughs> that's well, exactly what you wanted to say but yeah my final question mm-hmm. that i ask everyone with what you do what is it that you want to leave behind in the world what i want to leave behind in the world um I don't know. I think I'd, um, I think I'd, uh, I don't know, actually, I never really thought about that. And I think that, I think someone asked me a question like a, like, like years ago about like legacy and stuff like that. And I don't, I don't know if like, I think I had answered it. Like, I think it would be fine if like, I just like, if I just like passed and then, you know, like the world went on. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think I don't really, um, I don't really think about, think about like what it is that I want to like leave behind. I think I would like, I think I would just want to keep living like presently wherever I am. And hopefully, I guess like if anything, I hope that I can just like be an example for the people like in my world or my immediate like immediate world and hopefully they can feel like oh like maybe one day when they're growing up or when i've passed that they can feel like oh yeah like uh, you know your grandpa taught me this or like you know or i learned this from donnell or or remember when donnell did this or whatever like i think those are those little moments those are the only things i would love to like leave behind Mm -hmm. and maybe generations down the line my great 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 grandkids won't know who i am and that's like that's chill with me. <laughs> mm, I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Donnell, yeah. thank like, you. Yeah. I think it's like, you know, when you like, you can only skip a rock so many times. Yeah. So it's like when this rock decides to sink, then that's, that's, it's, its, that's time. its place in the ocean. I mm. feel like that's how I would like to live mm. when I pass. Yeah. Thank you so much for yeah. sharing all of your thoughts. This was a really deep and philosophical conversation, which I always, always <laughs> really enjoy uh, very, very much. If people want to connect with you, if they want to connect with the amazing community library mm-hmm. book section that yeah. you have um, uh, started and yeah. launched, where can they find you? They can find the Instagram account. It's book and then two underscores section. Or you can come visit me at 1739 Venable Street and I'll be there every day. <laughs> and if you need book recommendations and you want to take out a book for free then yeah give people a nice loose two weeks to bring it back hopefully people bring it back 
if you want it a little bit longer, then just let me know. But yeah, you can connect with me on there. And then I guess, yeah, my personal Instagram is just Donnell Garcia and you can follow my uh, follow my photography journey. <laughs> <laughs> Your life's journey. Yeah, my life's journey. My art, my artist's journey. Yeah, your yeah, artist's yeah. journey. The artist's way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for your time. I yeah, really, really you. appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. I appreciate this too. Thank you so much for having me on uh, my very first podcast. Anytime. Yeah. Come back. Sweet. Thank, thank you. you. As always, thank you for being here and for listening. To learn more about today's guest, Visit the episode page for show notes and links on wearethecraft.com. You can find the entire podcast archive here or explore more conversations with past guests on Spotify and Apple. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button on these platforms, including YouTube, to get notified when new episodes drop. Any likes and shares on social media are deeply appreciated too. Sound and audio engineering for the show are by Andrew and Jaba Gaspis. All guest portraits and images are by Juno Kim. Appreciate you all and see you again soon.